Today we will continue with the discussion we started yesterday on platform work in Eastern Europe. And uh, today we will move to another part of Europe, to such countries as Italy, Germany and Denmark. I would like to remind the speakers that they, they will have about 15 minutes and I kindly ask them to respect this uh, time frame in order to have a time for discussion in the end. So I pass uh, the floor to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Alessandro Scelsi from the University of Bari, who will present uh, the national report on Italy. Okay. Thank you for giving me the floor and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what I am about to present is the first part of the Italian national report concerning the regulatory framework and case law in the field of platform work, while the second part concerning industrial relationships profile uh, will be presented by my colleague Ilaria Purificato. Now, just one second. Okay. So, in the national experience, the topic of platform work has historically crossed that of the escape from employed work, a phenomenon that began in the 90s following the extension through the technique of legislative assimilation of certain protections typical of employees in continuous not employed labor relationships. In the end, this operation had given shape to a relationship type substantially equivalent in function to paid employment, although it was uh, characterized by lower costs for the employer in terms uh, of the economic and regulatory treatment of workers. In order to counteract the increasing use of these contractual types in relation to formerly self-employed relationships that in practice presented the indexes of employed work, the legislator, after the bracket of the continuous not employed work by project, introduced Article 2 Legislative Decree Number 81 of 2015, the regulation of uh, heterogenized work, providing that self-employed relationships, uh, relationships that are concretized in mainly personal continuous work performances and which execution modalities are uh, unilaterally organized by the client, the rules on paid employment shall, uh, shall apply. The issue of the exit positioning uh, of such work relationships uh, in uh, the self-employment uh, paid employment dichotomy has been the subject of a long and heated debate in doctrine, partially resolved only thanks to the verdict of the Supreme Court, which defined the judicial dispute promoted by some riders who had carried out meals delivery at home on behalf of a touring company concessionary of the brand Fudora. In particular, the court declared uh, the full applicability pursuant to the aforementioned Article 2 of uh, all the safeguards of paid employment to the work relationships of the claimants. According to the Supreme Court, while not shaping to an intermediate third way to self-employment and paid employment, the legislator uh, would have developed a rule to ensure the uh, same protections of employees to a particular category of economically weak workers operating in a grey area on the border between the two relationship types. In order to establish a first organic regulation, although limited to the work uh, of the riders only, the legislator introduced with the law 100, 128 of 2019 a series of provisions aimed at ensuring minimum levels of protection for the category. This protection applied to all riders on a residual basis where the requirements for judicial recognition pursuant to the first mentioned Article 2 of the protection of employment are not met. Therefore, ultimately, in the hypothesis of casual uh, self-employment. Article 2, however, is a, a general scope rule, unlike the protections provided by the new law, specifically addressed to the riders, since it is the most widespread category of gig worker in the Italian labor market. In particular, the new regulation defined the riders as self-employed persons who carry out activities of goods delivery on behalf of others in the urban area and with the, the help of bicycles or motor vehicles through digital platforms. The law then provided a notion of digital platforms, identifying them in uh, the computer programs and procedures used by the client, which, uh, regardless of the place of establishment, are instrumental to the activities of delivery of goods, fixing the fee and determining the manner of performance of the service. 
Concerning to safeguards, the law has uh, also introduced provision on contractual form and obligation for information on payment and, and uh, on uh, non-discrimination and exclusion from the platform as a result of non-acceptance uh, uh, of delivery tasks and uh, insurance covers the, uh, cover against uh, accidents and occupational diseases. The most interesting element of a new regulation is represented uh, without any doubt, as mentioned by Professor Menegatti in yesterday's session, by the payment rule. The rule states that uh, in the absence of collective agreement which expressly provides for it, workers cannot perceive a fee based on the quantity of deliveries made by ensuring that uh, they receive a hourly wage at the minimum levels laid down in the scales of remuneration attached to national collective agreements in similar or equivalent sectors, signed by the unions and employers' organization, uh, which are comparatively more representative at national level. For the adoption uh, of this collective regulation, the legislature had given the social partners a period uh, of uh, 12 months uh, from the date of entry into force of the law and expiring on the date of uh, 3 November 2020. Expired this deadline, the only parameter that uh, a court may refer to would have been that contained in the scales of remuneration annexed to the only specific national collective agreement enforced until a few months ago, that is the logistics, transport goods and shipments one. This collective agreement has been undersigned from the main trade unions confederations, CGL, CISL and WIL, in December 2017 and expressly qualifies the riders as uh, employees. On September 15, uh, 2020, Asso Delivery, association representing the main platforms of food delivery such as Just Eat, Glovo, Deliveroo, Uber Eats, long engaged in a bargaining table with the three confederal unions has, uh, however, unexpectedly signed a new collective agreement with UGL Riders, a union supporting position close to the platforms once, on a regulation substantially flattened on uh, the minimum treatment provided by the law and addressed in particular uh, to prevent the application of the default payment rule provided by the statutory law and that of the wage clauses contained in the other uh, aforementioned concurrent uh, collective agreement. In particular, the new agreement has expressly qualified riders as a self-employed and set criteria for determining remun remuneration aimed at shaping an intermediate solution to piecework and hourly pay, centered on the recognition of a minimum gross wage of 10 euros to be adjusted on the basis of the actual time taken by the worker in carrying out the delivery activities as estimated by the platform. As clarified by the most recent circular of the Ministry of Labor, adopted on uh, November 19, 2020, yesterday, the collective agreements uh, authorized to uh, disapply the legal provision are those signed by a plurality of union agents and by organizations that, that have the requirement of greater comparative representativeness in compliance with the criteria established uh, by case law. So that this agreement would appear to be invalid since it was adopted uh, in the absence of uh, the above requirements. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Now, Ilaria, Dr. Ilaria Purificato from the University of Modena, and Reggio Emilia, and we'll uh, continue uh, the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Olga. Uh, as Alessandro said in the first part of uh, our presentation, I will focus on the effect of platform work on the Italian industrial relations system. Also in this case, the speech will be dedicated to the so-called riders and therefore to the workers of food delivery platform. We have selected uh, some topics uh, from the report for this presentation that are uh, all the new actors of the Italian industrial relations system in times of platform work, their initiatives and strategies, uh, the results achieved, and there is a focus on uh, the impact of uh, COVID on platform work and then conclusions uh, and proposals. So let's start. Uh, among the sources of uh, Italian law, it is first and foremost the Constitution in the Article 39 that uh, dictates a fundamental principle uh, on the subject, that is the principle of freedom of association. 
On the basis of these uh, principles, uh, uh, these principle, workers have the right to organize themselves into groups, even small or non-formal one, in order to pursue common interests and to act for the same purposes. Uh, the advent of a digital working platform has led to a partial change in the traditional structures because uh, it has introduced new players uh, which uh, have adopted uh, new strategies for claiming their, their rights. Uh, in fact, uh, the intrinsic characteristics uh, of uh, functioning of digital platforms um, have led to a difficulty for the traditional uh, trade unions uh, to intercept, uh, intercept workers uh, above uh, all uh, initially. And at the same time, uh, um, it has uh, encouraged the emergence of spontaneous coalitions of workers, overcoming the risk of uh, physical and psychosocial isolations. Uh, examples are Riders Union Bologna, Deliverance Milano, Deliverance Project Torino. Also on the business side, most of uh, digital uh, work platform have um, joined a new association representing their interests, it is uh, ASSO Delivery. Uh, with reference to the strategies uh, adopted, there is a partial review of the traditional instruments. In this way, first of all, uh, the workers' grassroots movements aim to blocking the service, which is a strategy driven by the, the same aim of the, the strike. Uh, then uh, there are demonstrations and protests uh, uh, promoted with uh, social networks, uh, which become an important vehicle to communicate their needs. And uh, there is uh, uh, the solicitation of the intervention of the institution. And um, uh, as far as the initiatives adopted by trade unions, uh, there is the legal action brought by CGL before the court uh, of Bologna against the algorithm of a food delivery platform that would discriminate against different riders when recognizing job uh, opportunities. On the whole, uh, as you, uh, we can see in the slide, the initiatives promoted uh, have led to important results, uh, both at uh, local and national level. For reasons of time, uh, I focus only on two collective agreements relevant to the sector, which are the collective agreement say, uh, signed by UGL Rider and ASSO Delivery, which, uh, as uh, Alessandro said, is the first example of collective bargaining at the national level for the sector, although uh, of dubious legitimacy and uh, the National Collective Agreement of Logistics and its protocols, uh, which initially uh, included the riders as a new professional figure and uh, extended to uh, employed, uh, employed rider uh, all the protections provided for uh, in uh, this National Collective Agreement. And now with um, a protocol uh, signed a couple of week, uh, weeks ago, it extended the protection relating to both uh, work performance and uh, economic and regulatory treatments provided by the same national collective agreement to self-employed riders. This protocol would um, implement the provisions contained in Chapter 5 bis, and in particular uh, of the, um, the legislative degree uh, 81 of 2015, and in particular would um, implement the, uh, the request of uh, Article 47, quarter, second paragraph, which, uh, as we said, uh, in the absence of, uh, uh, for the purpose of defining uh, the remuneration of uh, such workers, uh, in the absence of a collective agreement of the sector, provides that uh, collective agreements of a similar or uh, equivalent sector would uh, regulate this parameter on condition that the latter is signed by uh, trade unions comparatively more representative at the national level. And in this sense, the national collective agreements for logistics uh, would uh, comply with these uh, features. The presence of uh, these two collective agreements at the national level has generated a climate of doubt about the collective agreement to be applied in relation to the various postponements made uh, by law. 
uh, with reference to this aspect, uh, as we say, a circular was published just yesterday by the Ministry of Labor, which also expresses uh, its opinion on the representativeness uh, requirements uh, required for a collective agreement to regulate uh, a work relationship, uh, the work relationship of riders. And this would suggest that uh, collective agreement signed by UGL riders and also delivery is not suitable to derogate from the provision uh, of law uh, because it would uh, not respect uh, these uh, requirements. Anyway, as announced by the Minister of Labor, the negotiating tables for the stipulation of a sectoral collective agreement uh, at national level are continuing. Uh, with the presence of trade unions, uh, ASSO delivery, and some of worker, uh, workers' uh, grassroots movements. Uh, now, with reference uh, to the health emergency situation caused by COVID uh, pandemic, it has to be said that the riders had to fight for the min uh, minimum necessary protections. Uh, in fact, during the first national lockdown, uh, food delivery riders uh, continued to work because their service uh, was considered uh, like uh, an essential service. However, this importance in terms of uh, activities uh, carried out was not matched by the same amount of uh, protection. In fact, the companies of the sector did not provide workers uh, with uh, the necessary safety equipment. And uh, as a consequence, rider uh, appealed to um, judge to obtain them uh, and uh, trade union supported them in, um, in their uh, request to platform companies, uh, minister of labor and judges. Uh, in conclusion, uh, despite the risk of this intermediation, the evidence produced by the platform work on uh, collective interest and collective bargaining uh, would seem to lead that uh, uh, lead to the consideration that the need of uh, representative and uh, protection for the platform workers could seem give new lifeblood to uh, in the industrial relation. Uh, in this uh, last slide, uh, we um, report some of uh, our proposals for trade unions, uh, social partner, and the European institution. We express it uh, in, uh, in our report. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Lalia, for your very interesting presentation and uh, for being perfectly in time. And now I pass the floor to our next speaker, uh, the, uh, Professor Rudiger Krause from the University of uh, Göttingen, who will present a national report on Germany. Yes. First of all, do you see and hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, I okay, see. okay, that, that's fine, because at the beginning I had some, some technical problems, but now it seems to work. So, second point, I've uh, also prepared some slides and I'll try to upload them. Uh, uh, yes, you have check. more to present yes. now? Yes. You're right, uh, corner. Bit, okay, uh, allow. And now the point is, where are the slides? I, I see the you slides. Have choose, you have to choose window. Yeah. To share the so I see my slides, but do you see the slides? No, no. I don't see it. You ah. must uh, use the window and share it. Okay, okay. But you find it? Uh, well, there is a. Up, 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 up. There is a, a, a button uh, allow sharing. Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, uh. That's okay. It does not work really good. You have to. You have to. Did you find it? Well, there is an, um, a button. Uh, then you go to your slides. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I try to go to my slides, but I see them, but I fear that you do not see them. No, because then you have, when you go to your slides in PowerPoint, you will have a sign. So that sign in PowerPoint, it's. Um, uh, I don't know how to show it. Just okay, okay, I will go back. Uh -huh. Otherwise, it will. 
Uh, crazy. Um, is it possible that I send you my slides and you show them? Okay, just send it. Okay, so it. Uh, I need one second to come to the. Uh, sorry for that. I, I, I try to check it. Uh, one moment, please. Yes. Yes. I have to open my uh, mailbox. So, uh, attach and um, send. Okay, just one moment. Ah, it doesn't work because uh, it's it's open in my my window. Uh, I think I have to close it. Ah, it's it's crazy because it's um, sent. Okay. Okay. It hasn't yet arrived. Okay. Just one moment. Okay, there was a sign that the, sh the, the, the screen could not be yeah. shared because it, there was a technical problem, um, apparently. But if you have the slides, then you can... Yes, one uh, moment. Uh, perhaps I'm not, I'm not authorized to do this. I will try now. Okay. 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 Yeah, great. Okay, I, I see the slides okay. and I, I, I uh, suppose that uh, all the other participants also see the slides. Okay, okay. so then, then I, I can start. Okay. Well, yeah, dear colleagues, we, we lost only five minutes, so I think this is, <laughs> this is okay. Um, well, y yesterday, uh, just in time for our workshop, the uh, Federal Minister for Labor and Social Affairs um, published a paper. You can go to the second slide if, uh, if, yes. you, if you want. Just uh, one moment. Do yeah. You, okay. you see the second slide? Yes. And you can uh, uh, well have the full screen because uh, on the left side all the other slides. Uh, I can yes, see them. Just one moment. Mm -hmm. Do you see it now full screen? Or? No, 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 no. Only, well, it, it, it would work, but 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 okay. uh, it, it would be better if uh, well the full screen uh, would be presented. Okay, okay, but but but, but I can start no problem. Well, I said yesterday the the our federal uh, minister for labor and, and social affairs. Yeah, that, that's right, okay, that's right. Okay. Yeah, together just with tell the, me, just tell me when I have to change. Yeah, the yeah, time. yeah. No, no problem, no problem. Okay. Uh, he he uh, published a paper in a in a journal uh, statement a common a statement together with the federal minister for justice and consumer protection and they dealt in particular with that what we are doing here uh, the question of of uh, uh, online uh, platforms and the benefits uh, which uh, they have uh, for consumers for companies and so on but also the pitfalls and uh, this is interesting because this means that there is a policy momentum uh, in order to uh, come to well regulations uh, on that that topic there are some some statements i've, I've uh, uh, taken from this uh, statement um, uh, no place for wild west methods in germany and the rules uh, for the social market economy must also uh, apply to online business and the most important point for our purposes here we will strengthen the rights of, of platform workers towards uh, platforms uh, i will come to this um, uh, propositions uh, in a minute uh, because this is uh, well this is um, 
part of the current developments. But first of all, I will uh, deal with some things which are uh, actually now in uh, Germany existing. So um, the next slide, please. Yes. Yes. As uh, you can imagine, uh, and according to the, uh, um, um, uh, to, to the announcement of the ministers, we do not have so far uh, uh, legal, uh, legal uh, regulations on, on platform work uh, in Germany. There is, uh, there is something on, on, on the right side also. Um, must um, put, I think, I think there is an additional, um, well, window on, on the right side. Uh, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, you can you can show only uh, only one or the side. other. Yeah, yeah, o only one this or side. the other. Uh, uh, normally, you can can uh, show about both of them. But but it's it's okay. I can can manage it. We have many classifications in academia because uh, since, I uh, would say since five years or so, there is a large and uh, intense discussion, uh, not only from lawyers and labor lawyers, but also from uh, economists, industrial socialists and so on. And of course, uh, um, a lot of them um, have developed um, different classifications. I think the most of uh, most important is uh, the um, distinction between local based and web based platforms. And of course, both of these um, um, phenomenons uh, do exist uh, in Germany, local based, that means delivery riders, uh, Uber, but Uber not, not so intensive because of uh, restrictions uh, on, on the case of, of uh, uh, well, the uh, transportation of persons that is very strictly limited uh, in Germany. And so Uber uh, is not, was not very successful uh, on the German market, but riders like Deliveroo, Fudora and, and something like that also exist in Germany, of course. Um, I will not uh, go too deep into the uh, classification of the different systems, internal, external platforms, indirect, direct. We will see that some of the uh, distinctions will play a role in the legal classification uh, according to existing law, but I will come to that uh, when, when it makes sense at that, that, that point. So, um, please, the next slide. Uh, let me come to some... No, uh, the whole next slide, yes, uh, indeed. Um, uh, let me come to the empirical uh, data. I will not bore uh, you too much, and uh, but there are a, a lot of um, studies and surveys in the, the past few years. Unfortunately, they do not come to um, a similar and comparable uh, results. We have some studies which say that uh, uh, there is, um, well, perhaps more than a million, million people who are uh, frequently using um, um, uh, online platforms and who are working via online platforms. On the other hand, uh, there are, there are um, other surveys which come to uh, much lower uh, figures uh, in, in Germany. For instance, um, um, another survey which says, uh, well, about 100,000 to 300,000 people are using uh, or are working via, via platforms um, uh, per month and only a very small figure uh, between, let's say, 3,000 and 5,000 people are working uh, in order to spend their life uh, uh, on, on the uh, income of uh, working via, via platforms. So, in total, um, it is, um, I think, worth to mention that uh, so far, uh, uh, platform workers and, and uh, other workers, gig workers, um, play only a marginal role on the um, uh, German uh, labor market. Uh, a lot of uh, people are working beside their uh, other job or uh, they, they are studying or something like that. Uh, so uh, it is, an, it is an, uh, um, a part of the German labor market. Of course, it exists. But so far, it it's play it plays only a marginal role. But um, um, the uh, figures have um, increased uh, in the past few years, and in particular as it comes to the uh, current um, Corona uh, pandemic, uh, there are hints. Unfortunately, not. Um, uh, official data and official statistics, but there are hints that in particular the uh, persons who are delivering food, um, uh, uh, the number have uh, increased in the past uh, a few months. So, um, can you um, open also the other windows of that? It, 
Ah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, there are uh, also additional uh, data on the question on the uh, social, demograph uh, social demographic um, uh, situation of the crowd workers and the question uh, how much money do they earn. Um, and um, you can see perhaps on the on, on the right side, <laughs> this is the um, uh, uh, last um, a part of the of the slide yeah that's true that only a minority of the crowd workers are earning a lot of money and they live from uh, that uh, uh, kind kind of work uh, for many of them of course it's only um, an additional uh, income and this could also uh, i think uh, this will also uh, influence the way how to cope and how to regulate this kind of uh, workers so um yeah the next slide please um as Vincenzo yesterday said, classification matters. Indeed, this is the uh, this is the point. Uh, and uh, in, according to German law, we have um, a, a general distinction: employee on the one side, self-employed persons on the other side. But also a third category in the middle, in in between of them, the so-called employee-like person, uh, and. Um, particular group of that, uh, the so-called home workers. I will come to the relevance uh, of that uh, in a minute. It's, it's all, uh, first of all, um, um, a general overview of the possible classifications uh, German law provides for these kinds of persons. So, uh, yeah, the next slide, please. Um, the general um, meaning, of course, if if somebody is classified as a as a employee, the whole uh, bulk of of uh, employee protection uh, law uh, will apply on that person. There are, of course, uh, problems of enforcement of law that, that is that is evident, and and uh, this uh, does not. Uh, it's, it's not only a question of of uh, the, those people who are working online or gig workers. It's also a general question of labor law and employment law, and we should take also this this in mind that the application of existing law is not uh, the solution to, to all problems. But the first step, of course, is uh, the question whether or not uh, somebody is, can be classified or qualified as an employee. Uh, according to German law, there is a section introduced only in 2017. And to put it very shortly, uh, two elements are absolutely indispensable. There must be a duty to work and there must be a legal subordination. Uh, this is um, uh, the, the, the um, uh, well, the, the section reflects case law, which has been developed over decades uh, since, since uh, uh, by the Federal Labor Court and and the uh, German legislature has only put that what was developed by case law into the uh, German civil code. Uh, the right side, please. Uh, yeah, um, there is very few case law so far. I will mention only one and, and uh, the most important decision so far uh, by the uh, regional court of Munich in, in Bavaria. It was a person who was, uh, who was um, charged with the testing of goods in stores and, and gas stations and so on. And he got his uh, um, uh, tasks uh, via, via um, uh, the internet, via app, um, working 20 hours per week or so and earning, um, well, Southern 700 euros, and after more than one year, uh, the, the the platform finished uh, and terminates his, his contract. And the question is, and now he sued uh, uh, the, the platform for being employee. And the the main point of the decision, very long decision, uh, of the um, um, regional court was to say, well, there was no duty for the person to work. He can. Uh, uh, um, um, decide uh, uh, voluntary to take a, a task or to deny it. And so uh, the, the basis uh, for uh, um, um, qualifying him as an employee does, does miss. And uh, the, the uh, court, um, well, accurately uh, also uh, co uh, considers the question, is there something like a factual obligation? And is there a pressure uh, to take the task? And, and they say, no, in this particular situation, it was not. Uh, and so uh, they uh, do not, uh, well, they deny uh, the, the question um, um, or the, the um, pretension uh, that this person uh, should be qualified as an uh, employee. So this is uh, one, according to German law, um, one of the main problems we have that uh, normally these persons um, do not have a real obligation to work. They have a general um, framework um, uh, contract, but the uh, the the single or the the individual uh, a task is not uh, uh, it's not an obligation to do this. It's only something like economic pressure, and this does not in the 
view of the uh, court of this court um, uh, is sufficient uh, for the qualification of employee. The case is still pending and, and we're expecting, um, well, I think next year, the decision of the Federal Labor Court and it would be very interesting to see how they uh, cope with that uh, point. Next slide, please. Um, as regards um, the question of employee-like persons, I've said, said that this is the third category according to German law. Um, and this means um, very short that there is a, um, a medium level of protection. Some uh, acts do apply also to employee-like persons, but very important acts do not apply, in particular minimum wage act uh, and, and uh, the protection against unfair dismissal. And this is, of course, a great lack uh, for those, those uh, persons. The criteria, also very short, there must be some kind of economic dependence. No legal subordination, that's not necessary, but an economic dependence. Um, uh, and um, uh, this uh, is um, situation that this might be a situation, it's a question of, of uh, case to case decision that might be the question and, and uh, the case in a lot of, lot of situations. But there might be also situations where um, um, workers or well, platform workers work for different platforms, and so. Uh, there could be a problem uh, uh, in, in um, uh, applying that, that, that kind of qualification. Next slide, please. Um, um, a particular group um, of, of employee-like persons are home workers. We have a particular act on this, uh, the Home Working Act, normally that are very traditional forms of, of working, uh, manufacturing some, some things and, and, and then giving it to a tradesman, which, which uh, does, uh, does the marketing on that, a very, very old act. But um, a couple of years ago, 2016, the uh, Federal Labor Court has applied the act to a very modern kind of, of work working an IT construction uh, who was also working uh, online and they say well um, this was not an employee according to the circumstances of that what he's doing but uh, uh, this act could be applied um, but at the end of the day uh, the protection is not very high there are sometimes a working time protection safety and health and so a Wage regulation is possible, uh, according to uh, um, some committees uh, who have the who are uh, the, the possibility or the option to to um, set some some uh, minimum wages. But uh, there are still no uh, particular um, wage regulations for this new kind of of um, 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 uh, work. So next slide, please. Well, yeah. Five minutes or less. yeah, okay, no, no problem. Um, next slide I can make very, very short uh, because this is a general problem uh, and um, a problem which is um, um, mainly uh, a question of European law because according to German law, I can also put it very short, it would be possible that also platform workers uh, uh, form coalitions uh, and, and uh, um, um, well, collective agreements, but uh, on the right side, you know, the European law, antitrust law, and this is not, of course, a particular German uh, discussion. Um, yeah, the right side, please. Um, uh, slide. Um, um, you know, the, the discussion uh, on, on the European level, FNV Kunsten, is, is uh, the question how, how to interpret it, narrow or broad. Uh, I will not repeat it. Uh, when Shane said uh, yesterday something on that, uh, and, and also Emanuele, and, and, and this is, uh, well, would only a repeat of the discussion. Much more interesting is the next slide because I will come to that what the social partners in Germany uh, did. Um, the IG Metal, it's a German metal workers union, launched uh, something like a, um, a website and in 2015 the order is, uh, the, the, the uh, main uh, intention was to, um, well, to, to um, will bring um, uh, uh, crowd workers together and to um, make some, um, give them the opportunity to, to evaluate uh, the platforms uh, and to uh, combat and to tackle the information asymmetry, which is normally uh, um, in the relation between the platform on the one side and the crowd workers on, on the other side. Um, this apparently works. Um, uh, and uh, who is interested in that, uh, you can see it uh, on um, uh, the website if you, if you go to faircrowdwork.com. Next uh, um, slide, please. Um, there are some um, uh, crowd workers, uh, crowd working operators in, in, in Germany who have uh, launched a so-called code of conduct uh, in, in 2015. It's unilaterally uh, made uh, with some, some um, elements, no unlawful tax, uh, commitment to fair 
remuneration and so on. And the, the much important point on that is that uh, the question how to enforce it. And now I will come to the next uh, slide, please. Because this is uh, that that what uh, IG Metal had done. Uh, they they um, established uh, together with the the uh, crowd uh, working uh, companies and the crowd working the umbrella organization of that a so-called ombuds committee, uh, and this ombuds committee decides on disputes which are uh, occur between. Uh, platform operators on the one side and crowd workers on the other side and they have made since 2017 uh, about about 30 cases on that on different issues mostly remuneration and, and some thing uh, other, uh, other 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 points um i will uh, also um mention very shortly that that uh, the um, large um, trade unions in Germany, um, Verdi, the uh, trade union for services, and in particular the IG Metal, they have changed and modified their statutes, their bylaws, in order to organize crowd workers. Um, there are, uh, it's nearly impossible to get some valid figures on that, how successful it is. Uh, I've heard that they have some problems. Uh, some of them, uh, of these persons, um, are willing to to um, um, uh, be member, become member of a trade union, but very few of them. So next point, and then I will come uh, um, at more or less to the end. Um, as I've mentioned in the beginning, what is what are the next point of the German legislator? Um, the federal minister had announced that this would be, or this is the, the, his political goal, um, to introduce some kind of minimum notice for the termination of the contract between the platform operator and the, the, the crowd workers and, and gig workers, uh, the control of unfair terms, which is very prominently stressed in this, this paper, and uh, for instance, also the portability of elevation of workers. That is also an uh, important point because otherwise uh, each uh, worker who is changing the platform will start at the beginning and uh, uh, the, the minister will uh, combat this. And last slide, uh, Olga, and then, then I've, I've finished at that. Uh, next week, uh, uh, next Monday, uh, there will be a hearing of the Committee of Labor and Social Affairs at the, the German uh, Parliament. There, was a, there are proposals of the left party uh, which are uh, very far-reaching, I have to say, but they, they um, use or they, they, they propose some things which are also in the current discussion uh, in Germany how to cope with that uh, questions. I uh, will um, um, take only some, some uh, um, well, um, uh, examples for this. For instance, the question of shift of burden of proof. Who should, be, who should have the burden to prove whether or not a gig worker or a, a crowd worker is, a, is an employee? And normally the uh, employee has to, or the, the person who pretends to be employee has to prove it. And the idea is, well, to shift the proof to the, um, uh, to the, to the platform operator if some, some um, um, requirements uh, are met. Or, Next point, the, the um, digital access of trade unions. That's also a very important point, and this could also be tackled. I'm not, um, and this should be my last last sentence, I'm not uh, convinced that this very far-reaching uh, propositions will, will um, have uh, success and will be successful in the political process, but some of the elements could be part of the um, proposal and the, the draft which uh, the current uh, uh, Labour Minister will um, well, propose in the next few months, let's say December or the first quarter of, of 2021. Okay, that's all. Last slide. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Rudiger, mm -hmm. uh, for your very interesting presentation. And now we will uh, go on with another presentation. And I pass the floor uh, to, Nat to Professor Natalie Wiederbeck Michael from the University of Aarhus, uh, Denmark. Okay, um, I hope you can hear me. I am just sharing my slides. Yes. Um, and I hope you can see that as well. Okay, so um, thank you for that presentation, Rudiger. That was quite, that was very interesting. Thank you. Um, so to look a little bit at Denmark, um, first of all, um, just jumping straight into it, uh, before we get on with some data on um, platform workers in Denmark. Uh, just to start at the very beginning, when we talk about terminology about platform work, uh, this is uh, 
this is part, I think, uh, part of the root of the issues that have uh, that we have struggled with in Denmark. The term platform work was used before we had digital platforms. It referred to persons working on oil rigs, offshore oil rigs. So if you mentioned platform work, they would think you were talking about persons. So you had to really, really explain, oh, this is digital platforms. Um, but also the terminology has been sort of uh, started as a focus on the digital economy and Denmark wanting to be like the digital number one uh, economy in the world. So everything digital, digital came like with the silver lining. It was fantastic and we liked it. So, so there was a, a great reluctance to start um, uh, distinguishing between types of digital platforms. It was all called the sharing economy. And the idea of a digital economy, gig economy, platform economy, it was called digital entrepreneurship. Uh, and of course, this line of terminology, uh, as um, Janis Bellacci mentioned yesterday, is also used intentionally to sort of plant or promote particular ideological conclusions on this. And the, and the, and the sort of great example that we sometimes see in in the Danish media is this uh, uh, these companies that are started by Danish guys on uh, parental leave and they didn't want to clean the house themselves and and so they said oh can't we there's probably a lot of people that would like to work a little bit and they started this in the garage and it's sort of this real entrepreneurship idea of uh, some of the best, the most well-known digital platforms in Denmark that provide services to private people, such as uh, the picture is from the, the Minister of Employment is handing the Happy Helper guys that started the Happy Helper platform, which is not covered by an, a, a collective agreement, a prize for being sort of a role model for digital entrepreneurship. Um, whereas on the other hand, you have a platform work used as the preferred terminology by researchers, academics, trade unions, and also some media. Sometimes, of course, also in this area of the sort of um, the terminology can be used in a way that it becomes a little bit harsh. And and in when that when when that happens, uh, the reaction is that uh, the discussion stops, the dialogue simply stops. So I think from the beginning, the, the dialogue uh, or the terminology from, from the um, academia side was so uh, harsh that it was difficult to get into dialogue with the other side. You were simply from two different worlds. But now it's uh, calmed down a little bit and we can all talk about platform work, at least in academia. Um, so uh, on platform work in Denmark, and when we talk about platform work, it's simply any work distributed by digital platforms. There's no distinction right now between whether the work is a gig work, crowd work, a cloud work, as uh, Rudiger mentioned, it's all considered platform work as long as it is work that's distributed via a digital platform uh, where you put customers in um, connection with uh, service providers and uh, service providers are, are always contracted as self-employed right so and uh, there's no recent survey on this uh, also as Janice Bellacci mentioned yesterday the data is a little bit old um, it is being updated in 2020 but it's still not released um, the situation in Denmark has been that uh, there's quite a lot of um, Labor platforms in Denmark. Oh, I forgot to turn on the time. Typical me. Okay, there we go. Uh, there's a quite a lot of uh, labor platforms in Denmark, but only about 1% of the population in the um, active labor years uh, had been involved in offering services via labor platforms. Of those persons that had experiences, most of them were in the youth, 20 to 29 year old. There were a more like a, a larger incidence of uh, people from a non-Danish background. We have um, migrating workers or uh, uh, persons on uh, tourist visas or study visas that work via the platforms. And um, uh, the data also shows that there's a, a spread across educational backgrounds. There's also a spread that 
most of them, uh, most of the work is done by people that has it as a supplementing income. So the, um, so the conclusions of that report, which is old, was that um, it's very low. There's not a lot. It's not yet really a factor in the Danish labor market. Um, that it attracts different groups in society, and platform work is used as a supplementing income. Uh, or supplementing to educational grants, which is the state that pays us money to study, or as a way to start gaining like step-by-step -step access to the labor market. So those conclusions weren't dangerous at all. Um, and uh, if we just look at what COVID-19 did to platform uh, workers, uh, we had uh, quite a uh, quite a varied sort of uh, impression from that. Some platform companies experienced an increase in business. The takeaway delivery platforms had extra work because uh, people, the restaurants were closed and could only do takeaway. Also, the IT services that uh, that give uh, IT services to companies increased. Um, Whereas some platform companies simply did not have any business during those months. It's a chapper who provides uh, restaurant services or event services because there were no events were allowed. And Vocali that provides interpretation services to uh, government um, and to uh, private companies that does international work and there's no inter interaction with international work. So, so those, they almost closed. But also the COVID-19 illustrated, perhaps for the first time, that platform companies are, um, uh, are in a situation where they, they do not fit the normal models in Denmark. Because as you probably know, the Danish government uh, mobilized some really, really, really um, uh, strong help packages to all companies in Denmark with a view to reduce dismissals. It meant that companies, instead of dismissing employee when there was no work, they could get money from the government to uh, cover 80% of the employees' salaries. And this means that they didn't need to re uh, dismiss the employees, but they could keep them. So it was like a measure to uh, give money to reduce dismissals. But of course, this, uh, this means that you have to have employees. And you have to have employees that normally has a certain amount of work. So platform companies, as they insist on not having employees, they were not eligible for these uh, help packages. Also, the few platforms that do have um, employees because they are set up as temporary work agencies, uh, the employees are hired on zero hour contracts, which means that there were no hours that they could, like there was no hours to cover. So they were also not eligible for these work packages, help packages. And this means, and in this situation, the platform companies as such was like visibly not uh, looked after in the business uh, of, in the business uh, packages of Danish uh, government, but also the platform workers were not looked after because they were not protected from dismissals in light of COVID-19. But as you see, the, the results were fluctuating. It was not, platform companies per se, but it was the service that's provided. So this would hit uh, the service regardless of whether it's provided by a platform company or by a normal company. Okay, so uh, looking a little bit at the legal framework for platform workers in Denmark, um, we do not have any uh, general uh, statutory legislation that's aimed specifically at regulating platform work. This is completely in line with the normal way of the Danish model, is that we try not to legislate on stuff. Um, so, so for this reason also, the government, although it's a focus point, has not decided to enter into this uh, question with uh, a solution that's based on statutory legislation. So the question remains, of course, well, about existing legislation, where, whether the platform workers will be have a status as employees or self-employed. And just as we've heard many times um, uh, in Denmark, there's only two categories. There's only employee or businesses. And if you are uh, self-employed, you, you it's possible that you are a business, but you can also be a self-employed in a work relationship that resembles employment more. So 
regard, so the fact that you are solo self-employed does not in itself mean that you're always a business and it doesn't itself mean that you're always employed. It depends on the relationship to the where you are working or performing your services. So um, the assessment is a well-known uh, realities assessment, the prima facie a test where you look at the circumstances in each case. The criteria or the elements that the course will look at are developed in case law. We do not have a general legislation that says that these criteria must be there. It's simply criteria developed by case law. And as you can see, they resemble a lot of the criteria that are found in other legislations. Uh, but um, so we can easily pop all the uh, normal assessments into these uh, criteria. And that's done by the courts. A little bit of uh, hope has been uh, provided, or a step at least you could say, an intentional step to include more types of uh, workers that work under atypical employment conditions, which could co come into play for platform workers, is the new Holiday Act. Uh, for the first time since 1938, we had a thorough vision of our Holiday Act. And uh, in this, the, the legislators uh, in the prelim preliminary works, which is like binding interpretive uh, substance that the courts must follow, uh, the legislators stated that um, for self-employed that are not employees, because self-employed can be employees, but for the self-employed that are not necessarily immediately employees, freelancers, external consultants, and so on, uh, it's a specific assessment like it is today, but they say it's most in line with the protective purposes of the act that status as employee is not lost, uh, is only lost when there is a basis for constituting independence in the performance of work for another person and decisive is whether the person in reality is self-employed. And this sounds a little bit like um, the test uh, we see from the Court of Justice in the constant informatia ruling where they say, well, you may be self-employed, but it depends on this relationship. Are you in reality self-employed? Do you have the independence that characterizes self-employment or are you in reality more in a dependent relation? So this is, a, this is a, a, an innovative novelty and uh, we expect a lot from it. Uh, it's new, it's just turned, it's just come into force, so we don't know what the courts will say to this and whether they will actually apply this sort of presumption of employment status, um, which is the novelty. Anyway, uh, another, just another little corner is that some platform companies have decided to use the Temporary Work Agency uh, Act, although they don't really fill out, the, they fulfill the criteria but they're just using it as a way to use existing regulation to give uh, good uh, terms to their workers so that the workers, when they work for an entity, they are entitled to the same working conditions as employees in the receiving entity. Um, so if we look at collective agreements and the role of the industrial, uh, of the social partners, um, also here we have a general framework that allows for social partners to conclude agreements for any worker. That means any atypical worker, as long as you work on terms that are typical of employment. Um, also, regardless of whether you are called freelancer or external or whatever, it's the realities that decide. The labor court will in the end assess whether there are workers working as workers and not only uh, workers working as self-employed uh, at the entity. And this means that the trade unions can also engage in industrial action, also towards platforms. In Denmark, it's not a requirement that you have to have a member at the platform or at the company you want to cover. As long as work is performed by workers uh, of, the, of the character that you want to cover. So, so technically, uh, it's an avenue uh, to engage in industrial action against the platform companies. It hasn't been used yet. We haven't had a test uh, on this, uh, but we have had the results with the negotiated collective agreements anyway. They have been sort of amicable uh, uh, negotiations. The Hilfer platform, which is also one of those platforms that was started in a garage by three friends, 
uh, they contacted the trade union and said, we would like to make sure that we are not undermining the Danish uh, model, and please could you help us with an agreement? So that was like a, a, a very good uh, example of uh, a, a platform company wanting to do it the right way. So the Hilfa agreement was the assault, result where, where they tried to innovate and say, well, we cannot for sure say whether they are employees or not, but we will have a presumption that they are employees with employee rights when they have worked more than a certain number of hours for the platform. Uh, but if they want to uh, become to stay as freelancers, like self-employed freelancers, they can do that. So it was sort of left to the individual um, Hilfer uh, service provider to choose uh, his own status as employee or as uh, independent with regards to the agreement. This was uh, overruled by the Danish antitrust authorities, which as late as now, August 2020, uh, took a stand on the status of um, of uh, service providers providing uh, services via platforms. They took a status on the Happy Helper platform, which is a cleaning platform, and Hilfer, which is a cleaning platform. And they said in both those situations, the, work, the, the, the uh, service providers are not workers from an antitrust point of view. So now we have an, 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 a situation where the um, antitrust uh, authorities say one thing and the trade unions uh, say another thing. So that's very unfortunate, of course, that there was no sort of strategic alignment uh, with this. Um, so finally, we can say that although there has been these really, really good and innovative steps so far uh, with agreements, um, so far uh, it has not sort of spread or extended to use the other instruments available to trade unions uh, in Denmark. Um, there has been no industrial action. I, we know that uh, negotiations are ongoing, but we also know because of the sort of uncertain status with regards to antitrust, with regards to the EU, we had this, the latest court of justice ruling of Yodel was, oh no, now we don't know anything again. So, so this whole uncertainty means that it's not a good climate to try to pressure um, uh, platform companies into negotiation. And um, perhaps also it's not a good climate as, um, as uh, Janice Belacis mentioned yesterday, maybe it's not the best idea to have this assessed by the court because the judges may not be educated very well on how does digital uh, the digital labor market work, what does subordination look like uh, when it's an algorithm making decisions on your behalf. So there could also be a reluctance uh, on that part um, that remains to be known. So to just put a little bit of, of the status and also maybe on the future is that we've seen there's sort of a, a sometimes giant babies, sometimes no steps and sometimes giant steps. And at the time there's like no steps because the antitrust ruling sort of stopped everything. There's no initiative from the government. It was a, a baby of the former government, which was a um, right wing government. Now we have a social democratic government. They are not as concerned with a digital uh, business and competitive uh, business. Uh, and they are not picking up on that this is an issue uh, they should be engaged in, at least not yet. Uh, so we see that the agreements with Hilfa and Vokali, who were the, like the world first and innovative, they are still being renegotiate, renegotiated and it's difficult to, to reach agreements because now they don't know if the agreement again will be overruled by the antitrust uh, authorities. The tax authorities and the antitrust authorities are not interested in talking with the trade unions. The trade unions really want to engage in like uh, collaborative policy making on this. So we sort of take it a societal point of view together. They are not interested in, uh, in inviting the trade unions inside. And this means that we are, it's like a legal vacuum at the moment. And I just think that for the future, the void, when there's a legal vacuum, something will fill the vacuum. So that can be the trade unions that can engage. It could also be the antitrust authorities that take the lead on this in Denmark. It could be the platform companies uh, it could be the trade association that just support digital entrepreneurship, uh, regardless of the level of uh, technology that, as um, 
as Vincenzo mentioned yesterday, it could be the EU, uh, either by the Commission or by the Court of Justice, that sort of puts us forward a little bit. It's probably not going to be the Danish legislators or the government, unless they do it by tripartite agreements and negotiations with the, with the social partners. So, whomever will be victorious, of course, as we know, will have a great impact on the future social security and labor market in Denmark, uh, which is, uh, as you know, a special um, balance between flexibility and security that should uh, hopefully go hand in hand. But that in, in this specific area, uh, it's not a very close uh, dance, I have to say. That finishes my presentation for today. Thank you very much, Natalie, for a very interesting presentation. And now we have some uh, time for the debate. Uh, please do have some questions, um, comments. I would have a question, but not, of course, to myself, but to Natalie. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, may I pose the question? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you. <laughs> and Natalie, one question. Um, do you have some idea on the content of the, um, of the collective agreements? Uh, is there a, something like a minimum wage or, or maximum hours and so? Because I, my, my question is um, because of um, that was um, uh, presented, the code of conduct, uh, the unilateral, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, let's say working conditions. And yes. uh, if you take a look on them, they are very vague. Even w there are soft law, but not only soft law, but extremely vague. So the question is, even if, if uh, somebody would go to court, what what to sue for? Yes. And, and this, this is an important point. Uh, the, the accuracy or the, the preciseness of, of, of uh, collective agreements? Yes, uh, I can answer that. Um, sorry for not bringing that forward. In the collective mm, agreement okay. with Hilfa, we had two collective agreements with the platforms. One was aligning the platform working terms for interpreters with the existing agreement for interpreters. So that meant minimum wages, holiday rights, uh, mm. working time, mm. uh, pension rights and all of that. For the, for the Hilfa agreement, they were a little, uh, they had to negotiate each each right for, in its own because it was new. So they negotiated a minimum wage that followed the wage setting in the area of cleaning mm -hmm. because that's a type of work. Then they had a uh, formulation on well, holidays, they, the hol they were, had a right to holidays, paid holidays. They also had a formulation on that they should not be sanctioned uh, without due course mm -hmm. and this means that they couldn't be like blinded or put uh, below or something but there should some they couldn't be sanctioned without or, or um, yeah uh, thrown out from the platform without due mm -hmm. course and also there was a notice period for both parties if they mm -hmm. wanted to uh, mm -hmm. end um, there was no sort of transfer of rating because that's uh, more of a, an industry agreement that needs to be there because this was one, just with one platform, right? And um, and I think that was it. There was no pension rights. There was to be uh, renegotiated later. There was um, uh, the platform company was not yet a member of the. Uh, employers association mm -hmm. but that was part going to happen before the renegotiation so that the trade union would in reality negotiate with the employers association for the next time but those negotiations have not yet resulted in a new uh, Hilfa agreement mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you very much, Rudiger. And now, because of the time limits, I pass the floor to Eduardo Alice and we will proceed uh, with the second part of our webinar. Uh, good evening or good morning for our friends in the United States. Uh, my name is Eduardo Alles. Uh, I am professor of labor law at the University of Naples, Partenope, member of the scientific committee of the Marco Biaggi Foundation and scientific advisor of this project. And that's it for the moment, at least. So I would like to uh, warmly welcome the guest uh to this to this round table i would like to thank them to they have been so passionate to wait uh and uh to listen 
to our presentations. We have today as guests Susan Biesenbrapp, Thomas Jeff Jeffers School of San Diego, and visiting professor, University of Modern and Reggio Emilia. Hi, Susan. Uh, Ludovic Boe, uh, Confederal Secretary of the European Trade Union Council. Hi, Ludovic. Stefania Radici, Italian Federation of Trade, Tourism and Service, CGL. Hi, Stefania. Marco Marrone, Riders Union, Union Bologna. Hi, Marco. And Michele, last but not least, Michele Forlivesi, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Italian Minister of Labour. So we have many guests, not so much time, but I think that we organize in a way that everybody will have the chance to, to speak up, to make his or her points clear, and then we have, will have a short round of for remarks or replies in case uh, of comments of other speakers. So I would like to follow uh, the order uh, we have on the on the invitation. So uh, Susan, you have the floor and we are very interested in, in hearing something about this newest development on coming from California. Please Susan. Thank you very much, Eduardo. I'm assuming everyone can see and hear me. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, I was very interested in Natalie's comment about the legal vacuum because for uh, quite some time in California, there was a bit of a legal vacuum uh, and I was very concerned about it and I thought it was important to hold the government responsible for that legal vacuum. We uh, tend to allow governments to remain inactive and we don't say anything normative about that and I think it's a tremendously important Point. You must hold governments accountable. So in 2017, I co-authored a journal article with a Canadian scholar named Irvana Kwakwad, and we were taking a look at legal regulation associated with the de-standardization of work. And we wanted to understand how governments or regulatory authorities contribute to or on the other hand, prevent the decline of the standard employment contract. So this was a comparative project. We were comparing the US and Canada, and we developed an analytical grid or a matrix for evaluating three important government functions with the purpose being to hold governments accountable for inaction. So here are the three things we said governments need to do when they regulate. First, the government plays an essential role in describing and defining change in the labor market. Second, the government occupies an essential role as the protector of substantive legal rights in the labor market. And third, the government acts as an insurer against social risk and inequality. Now, in the article, we talked about the problem of regulatory capture by corporate interests. We took a look at the problem of regulatory capture, especially in times of political polarization. And what we said is that labor law enforcement efforts may be co-opted or they may veer very far from their mission when the political party in power has strong ties to business or corporate interests. But I confess that when we wrote this article, I never imagined that capture might involve the entire negation of the lawmaking function of the state. Now, just a few weeks ago in California, the platform companies accomplished a coup against the regulation of their business model. And to understand what happened, we need to go back two years to the year 2018. Protections for gig workers were first articulated by the California Supreme Court in 2018 in a case called Dynamex Operations West versus Superior Court 
of Los Angeles. And that case involved delivery riders for an on-demand same-day delivery company. At one point, these riders were classified as employees of, this, of the company. But to save money, Dynamex realized that they could classify these people, these riders, as independent contractors, and that's what they did. And two of the riders sued the company. The case was eventually heard by the California Supreme Court, and in 2018, it handed down a landmark ruling. The court explained that misclassifying employees, calling them independent contractors when they are really employees, harms workers and is unfair to workers as a matter of the public policy of the state of California. And then it adopted a presumption that all workers in California are employees for the purpose of California wage orders, which deal with such matters as compensation. To rebut this presumption of employee status, the hiring company, the platform company, must satisfy a test called the ABC test. And the ABC test requires the company to prove that the workers are, number one, completely free from the control and direction of the hiring company, completely free. Number two, that the workers perform work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. And finally, that the workers are in an independently established trade, occupation, or business. All three requirements are necessary to rebut the presumption of employee status. In 2019, just last year, with the gig economy in mind, the protections of this presumption of employee status were expanded through the lawmaking of the California legislature. And the California legislature adopted a law known as Assembly Bill number five. We call it AB5. AB5 extended the presumption of employee status beyond California's wage orders. It adopted the ABC rebuttal test as a requirement for the hiring companies for all purposes of employment including collective bargaining, occupational safety and health, and other employee protections. So this presumption of employee status went into effect on the 1st of January, 2020, just a couple of months before the pandemic hit in the United States. And it ensured that all California workers, especially gig workers, would get all the benefits that employees get. Minimum wage, overtime compensation, paid sick leave, paid family leave, the protections of equal employment opportunity law, the right to join a trade union, and occupational safety and health protections. Uber and Lyft in particular refused to honor the new law. So in May 2020, California's state attorney general, Javier Becerra, sued Uber and Lyft for misclassifying the riders. And on 22 October of this year, Uber and Lyft lost an appeal, and they were supposed to begin classifying the riders as employees within 30 days of that court date. Now, looking from 2018 until October 20, uh, 2020, we saw all three branches of the government in the state of California in alignment, regulating platform work. But something else was going on, which I'll talk about very, very quickly. After AB5 passed in 2019, a group of gig economy workers began a ballot initiative, direct democracy, they called it. On our ballot, on November 3rd, was a proposition called Ballot Proposition 22. 
And it amended the new law, AB5, and created an exemption from the new law for any company providing transportation and delivery services through an app. I'll talk a little bit more about the law. Suffice it to say, it passed with 58% of the vote. So the companies went directly to the voters of California, effective on the 5th of November, the companies themselves amended the new law. By mid-December, it will be clear that delivery and uh, transportation gig workers working for companies like Deliveroo, working for Uber and Lyft and Instacart, they will be classified as independent contractors and they will be given some minimal benefits, but they will not be subject to the new law. Seven-eighths of the California legislature will have to vote in favor of amending this law to change it in any respect. It is more difficult to amend this law than it is to amend the state constitution. So this is a tremendous, tremendous development. In fact, the companies effective this month have entirely captured the lawmaking process. They will be regulated by a law that they have given to themselves. And that's it for my eight minutes. I went a little over. Yeah, no, perfect, just, just two minutes. So uh, I have a request from Michele. Uh, he has to leave earlier. So uh, if you, uh, Ludovic don't, and Stefania don't mind, uh, I will give the floor to him. Otherwise, let me know. I'm just uh, trying to uh, coordinate it. So it's all right for you? Okay, no thank you very much. Thank you very much, you're very, very kind. So Michele, you have the floor. Th thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. <laughs> and th thank you to, to Ludovico and Stefania. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, I, have, I have to leave the call early. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Senatori and uh, all the webinar organizers, uh, as well as congratulate of the author of presentation for the national reports. And uh, in my big speech, uh, I will describe the structure and the rationale of uh, Italian legislation on platform work. I focus in particular on the, the, the compatibility of collective bargaining stipulated by, between ASSO Delivery and, and UGL with the referral that the legislator makes to the social partner for the regulation and remuneration. And I will illustrate the role that Italian Ministry of Labor is planning in uh, facilitating the construction of the relationship uh, system in food delivery that announced the reference to the social partner contained in Article 47 quarter of legisl legislative degree number 81, 2015. Italian law number uh, 128 of uh, uh, 219 introduced a double pro protected discipline from platform workers into the Italian legal system by adopting a re remedial legislative technique that we could define as a concentric circle protection. This legislative initiative is, uh, initiative is in perfect continuity uh, with the protective object of European social pillar and provides a significant contribution from the perspective of a common, common initiative by European Union improving, improving the working condition of platform workers and give a coordinated response, respo response to legal challenges posted by technological changes in the labor market, as announced by European Commission of, uh, for 2021. In particular, the law uh, 128 of 2019 gives platform workers different differential protection status according to their concrete activity. Continuous at organized collaboration, refer, refer to Article 2 of Legislative Degree Number 81 to, uh, to of 215, and occasional autonomous worker, according to Art, uh, Article 47 bis uh, of the same degree, 
without prejudicating the possibility of qualifying platform work according to general criteria of uh, employee in uh, as uh, according to article 294 of Italian civil code the ratio the ratio of the law is the protection of labor law in all these form in compliance with article 35 of italian constitution the qualification of uh, in, in its term of continuous heterogeneous organized collaboration involves the full application of discipline of employment while the qualification in term of occasional autonomous platform work guarantees minimum mandatory protection formal stipulation of work contract, guarantee of minimum payment, parameterized on national collective bargaining wage, prohibition of peace work pay, prohibition of discrimination, protection of personal data, right to disconnect, freedom of association and right to strike, insurance against accident and occupational disease, application and regulation of health and safety at work. In both in both cases, the most representative and social partners play a fundamental role. They, they have the, the possibility to create and adapt the legal discipline through collective bargaining. In this case of continual heterogeneous collaboration, the national collective bargaining, stipulated by comparative more representative trade unions at the national level, that provide for specific discipline regarding economic and regulatory treatment may derogate from the principle of the full application of the discipline of employment. While for the autonomous occasional uh, platform work, Article 47, quarter, fourth paragraph, ensures collective agreement with the faculty of defining criteria for determining the total remuneration which consider performance and work organization. In the absence of this agreement, in the pl platform war can cannot be paid on this uh, on basis of the levers made. The same worker must be guaranteed on a minimum horary remuneration parameterized by wage established by national collecting agreement in similar or equivalent sector, signed by trade unions and employers comparatively more representative at national level. In this regard, it must be considered that the right of set of the remuneration of occasional autonomous platform work by exclusive referring to peace work system does not, does not fall with the nego negotiation delegation provided for the fourth paragraph. The law authorizes the collective agreement to establish criteria for determining the role of uh, the overall remuneration that take into account the, the methods of performance of the service, as well as the organization of platform, but do, do not authorize the collective agreement to determine the remuneration exclusive reference on deliveries made by every single platform worker without respecting any other criteria of minimum guarantee. Payment is to be based on peace work is always forbidden in a minimum mandatory protection established by law. In order to make enforce most of the regulatory role of collective bargaining and facilitate the development of industrial relations to the delivery sector, in August 2020, the Italian Minister of Labor offered the institutional space to facilitate meetings between social partners and, the, and, the, and define a sustainable agreement to uh, regulate the work of relationship and platform workers. This attempt to facilitate industrial relations collided with the stipulation in September 2020 of a collective agreement between ASSO Delivery, the most representative association of company, and UGL, a representative trade union, but without the requirement of comparative representativeness. This collective bargaining introduced a, a, as the only form of payment of workers and remuneration only based on delivery that can be made by, uh, by the workers in an hour, uh, unilaterally defined by the platform. Uh, this contract, in contrast with the law, triggered strikes and protest reaction for workers, which led to reopening of a, of a confrontation with the, the legal uh, part, with the trade union actor. The institutional pressure of Minister of Labor after delivery reopened negotiation on pay, health and safety at work and fights against illegal hiring. 
the Ministry of Labour engaged to facilitate this negotiation by supporting social partners with the construction of the collection agreement in line with the provision of the law. It is an unusual but fundamental support to make and build the industrial reaction in this sector. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much, Michele. Thank you also for being in the times you you succeeded in showing us the very complicated uh, new legislation in Italy in a very clear and uh, scientific way. So uh, uh, without any further, I would like to ask uh, Ludovic Boe to take the floor. And we are very interested, of course, in hearing the position of DHC on this very hot issue. Please, Ludovic. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, I think it's we are at an important moment, uh, also at European level, uh, on this discussion. So it's quite uh, topical to discuss uh, this. It was uh, uh, really interesting to uh, to hear uh, from the national report and how uh, it is going on on the different discussion at that uh, national level. Also interesting to uh, have the insight from Susan on California as uh, this uh, um, California uh, vote for us it's a little bit a uh, disgrace uh, <laughs> because you don't uh, you cannot vote on uh, to define what is an employment relationship uh, you don't uh, ask uh, to the people what is an employment relationship what is labor condition and what uh, how you can uh, uh, collectively uh, defend uh, yeah how, how, what affects working condition cannot be uh, defined by a ballot uh, so of course uh, this is a really uh, a problem Problem, and we really want uh, to ensure that at European level, where we have a proper, cons uh, we can have a proper consultation of social partners, uh, where we have uh, industrial relations uh, that are really uh, organized. Uh, we hope that uh, the initiative that uh, the European Commission uh, will uh, be take, uh, taken uh, with respect of what uh, what is at stake. Uh, so the importance of reinforcing and ensuring the non-violation of labor and human rights of uh, platform uh, workers and we prefer to uh, to speak about workers in platform companies at the etuc and not about platform workers because platform workers would imply that there's some kind of another worker uh, other type of worker and that there can be a rationale for a third status uh, which is often what we hear also uh, in some member states so we clearly say at the etuc that there should be no third status between the uh, worker and the uh, self-employed so um, it is important to and the misclassification uh, of uh, workers and we uh, want uh, that at european level we can tackle this through a uh, reversal of uh, the burden of the proof by ensuring uh, an employee presumption uh, so that in the, uh, the these different sectors where uh, workers are active in platform we could apply an employee presumption uh, which would uh, as i said reverse the burden of the proof where for the moment, to self, uh, in fact, workers are uh, obliged to be classified as uh, to classify themselves as self-employed, and if they think uh, that in fact they are subordinate and that they, that they should be employee, they have to go to court themselves, and then maybe two, three, four hours uh, years after, uh, they will win, but individually with no change uh, of their condition because four years after they are not even uh, active anymore uh, for. The platforms they were working for uh, so this is uh, really not uh, the uh, ideal solution so we have to uh, to take from the le uh, different legal cases that uh, in Europe uh, show more than uh, more and more that there's a clear subordination um, uh, that uh, we have to take this moment this legal moment to transform it in a political moment a political moment where at European level we has the European Commission uh, to uh, ensure uh, the uh, yeah to ensure the enforcement of uh, labor and uh, social rights of uh, workers uh, in uh, platform companies so this is uh, the first step so a recognition of an employee uh, presumption 
but this employee presumption would not be enough if you don't act also on other uh, aspects because uh, one of the advantage that the platform companies have is that uh, they uh, they use self-employed that they can pay uh, less uh, than uh, uh, that than employee uh, and if you don't have um, a concrete action also on minimum wage uh, minimum tariff uh, that you can so uh, if it is more interesting to uh, contract a self-employed employed uh, than an employee uh, to have the employee presumption is not enough you have also to ensure uh, that the applicable uh, wages uh, of the sector uh, is also uh, obligatory and mandatory uh, for uh, the platform it means that uh, for self-employed it's also important to discuss about minimum tariff on the way which you cannot go uh, to contract the self-employed uh, so that we establish a level playing field uh, that ensures that uh, it's not uh, the platform that uh, make uh, in fact the, f uh, the the choice but that if you want to be a self-employed as a worker you are really choosing uh, yourself uh, to be uh, a self-employed so this is the uh, second uh, element then i would say that there are different uh, level of uh, social and labor rights that we have to ensure and I'd, uh, i will uh, uh, mention them uh, later but on the other hand we have also uh, uh, we do not want now uh, with the ETUC to enter in the discussion uh, of the definition of workers. We don't think that it's needed now. It, rather, we think it's uh, more uh, discussing about recognizing platforms as employers that should be the priority because now they are escaping responsibilities because uh, they have uh, uh, no uh, responsibility as employers. Uh, recognizing in member states the uh, responsibility of, uh, of platform as employers would uh, imply a lot, uh, would imply that uh, you can uh, ensure uh, that uh, who is responsible for health and safety regulations, uh, provisions, who is responsible for paying social security, who is responsible for tax, uh, also paying taxes uh, to ensure the level playing field with other uh, companies uh, paying uh, taxes uh, in the uh, in the country and also uh, for example on the uh, uh, transparency of the algorithm management etc so uh, all these elements uh, need that we uh, ensure that there's a recognition of the platforms as uh, employers uh, and that we uh, can then say that uh, in fact the platform uh, the application the platform in fact uh, is only a management tool to ensure uh, that uh, the the application in itself it's a management tool that organizes the production, that organizes the work that is done uh, by a worker, and there's an employer that should be responsible for that. Uh, we know uh, uh, that also in other uh, for the moment we are speaking about food delivery, about transport, but in ten uh, ten years, who knows in which sector of the economy it will be possible also with numeri uh, digitalization of the economy, it will also be possible possible in a lot uh, of uh, industries, in a lot of sectors to organize uh, the work through uh, an application. So it is also a question of how the employment relationship is uh, safeguarded and how do we ensure that uh, the fact that the management tool uh, is not anymore a human uh, uh, management tool um, with the human resource but that is transformed to an application uh, management um, is also framed uh, with a human in command uh, um, uh, control this means that we need transparency on how the algorithm work uh, on how uh, the choice to disconnect someone is taken uh, but all other also aspect uh, behind the, the question of the algorithm them. So this is uh, the part uh, that is crucial for us uh, to identify uh, the uh, platform as employers. Concerning, I would finish with this, concerning uh, the different uh, labor and uh, labor rights and social rights and wor uh, working conditions, uh, we think that it's important that workers uh, in these sectors, and but also self-employed, should access the minimum social protection, uh, the, 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 the social protection in the different uh, countries. We have seen with COVID-19 crisis how uh, vulnerable they are uh, mm -hmm. either they continued working but with risk uh, in food delivery either they had completely to stop but uh, 
yeah, few of them had access in the different countries to social protection system uh, and the different measures that were taken uh, by the member states often do not reach them because the different measures either support workers uh, to maintain them in the jobs or supported undertakings by giving them money uh, to ensure that they uh, uh, won't uh, fall and they don't have to close. But individual self-employed uh, are often not uh, um, are often overlooked uh, and not reached by uh, social security systems and uh, this is something that has to change. Secondly, and the, on these uh, elements, it's important to ensure the effective right to collective bargaining uh, for uh, these workers. A lot of workers, and I think uh, uh, it has been said and will be said uh, uh, in, uh, by the uh, following uh, speakers also, a lot of uh, initiatives have been taken to, uh, by workers to try to organize mm -hmm. themselves. But the fact uh, the fact is that the problem was not really that uh, they they didn't um of course, it's difficult to organize uh, uh, in the digital economy, but uh, the, what they lack was the fact that nobody uh, wanted to come at the other uh, side of the table. So the platform did not want to take uh, the uh, responsibility to go for collective uh, for collective bargaining. Uh, so uh, there are initiatives, there are unions working uh, to try to organize uh, these uh, workers, but at the, uh, uh, at the other uh, side of the table, there's nobody taking the responsibility as employer to discuss uh, these uh, different uh, working conditions, except in few cases, as it was said for Denmark with Ilfer. Uh, but uh, this is uh, some uh, somehow uh, problematic, as for example, in this case, this was uh, all, um, the, the, the competition authority, uh, the, uh, the antitrust uh, authority uh, did uh, yeah, uh, overrule the, uh, the, the agreement. So there we have also to ensure that at European level, competition law uh, does not impeach self-employed to organize uh, themselves uh, because what we have for the moment is um, uh, in competition law, self-employed are considered as undertakings. We think at the ETUC that you cannot consider a worker individually as an undertaking of course there can be an undertaking of one pe one person but individually yourself as a worker you are not an undertaking you have to uh, to access uh, you cannot be considered if you organize uh, you uh, yourself with uh, with others collectively you cannot be considered as a cartel um, so this is something also that has to change uh, at european level to recognize full uh, full rights of uh, collective uh, collective bargaining uh, then and finally, of course, working conditions, health and safety, uh, and different uh, yeah uh, different elements have also to be discussed. This is why we want the European uh, Union uh, to advance on that. Uh, commission, uh, the president of the the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, man mandate the Commissioner Schmidt uh, to work on this uh, to ensure uh, improvement of the situation of uh, platform workers. And uh, yeah, we think it's really urgent to take action. Eight uh, eight months after the uh, the beginning of the pandemic, uh, everybody says that uh, how crucial it is to uh, to protect uh, platform workers because they are they are at the uh, center uh, of uh, yeah, absence of social protection, but eight months after, still nothing has changed. So there's urgent action needed with, as I said, employment presumption relationship, uh, employment relationship presumption, access to social protection, access to collective bargaining, recognizing uh, platform as employers, and transparency of the algorithm uh, management uh, of the uh, algorithm as key, I think, uh, issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, with the uh, following initiative that we will be uh, taken by uh, the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ludovic. And I would like now to give the floor to Marco Marrone, Riders. You... And sorry, sorry, Stefania. <laughs> to Stefania Radici, okay. Italian Federation of Trade of Trade Tourism and Service (CGL). Sorry for this. No problem. Thank you, Professor Alex, for giving me the floor and thank to Jacopo Senatori and Marco Biaggi Foundation for hosting me in this interesting webinar. Let me make a preliminary remark. 
I think we are chasing a uh, running horse with a broken leg and some crutches. Uh, the leg is broken because uh, on one side we have dependent workers with a number of rights and protection granted by law and collective bargaining agreements. On the other side, we have independent contractors and labor law gives way to competition law. In the middle, we have a gray zone formed of people with a hybrid status between employment and self-employment, uh, entitled to a fraction of the protection received as employees, often not easy to be accessed. And uh, um, one of the two crutches is uh, legal proceedings. In some cases, courts uh, judge companies to provide atypical workers with the same rights as employees. You know the case of Court of Appeal of Turin uh, on, riders, on food or riders, or the more recent uh, case of Florence Court, with, which judged just it to provide workers with the necessary personal protective equipment as they were employees. The other crutch is collective bargaining, through which trade unions try to include, to bring precarious workers under their scope. One example is the collective agreements on logistics uh, and in the recent protocol, which uh, uh, Ilaria already mentioned. Um, and um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and this is one of one exact example. Who is the running horse? The running horse is the business model. It is roughly changing to fit for the fourth industrial revolution which is uh, making it possible um, to connect information objects and people due to the intersection of physical and virtual world uh, uh, it is transforming uh, the value chain both products and processes factories are now turning into smart factories with a few employees compared, compared to the massive growth in terms of, of turnover. Deliveroo Italy has 87 employees and a 40 million euros turnover. Just Eat Italy has 113 employees. We will see how many there will be in 2021, as just announced the plans to hire riders. Uh, and just it has a, a $53 million turnover. Facebook Italy has 49 employees and $146 million turnover. Zalando has 15 employees and $38 million turnover. Airbnb in Italy has 26 employees and $8.5 million turnover. Uber has 26 employees and 5 million euros turnover. So uh, usually um, this company keep their uh, technical and managerial profiles in their workforce um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and uh, um, all the other workers are not employees, uh, even if they are essential. For example, goods cannot be delivered without uh, transport workers. Be uh, transported without drivers. Offices cannot be cleaned without cleaners, uh, and so on. But they are not usually employees. Um, uh, please, we are not talking about uh, new kind of jobs, uh, home delivering of meals and goods, uh, renting of rooms and, and apartment, cleaning of offices and apartment, baby or dog sitting, driving people have always existed. The song is always the same, the Led Zeppelin would say. We are now talking about new ways for engaging people, uh, for engaging workers. Companies don't find them, are they to find companies? And what is expected from them is, let me say, a love relationship without commitment. Uh, the value chain has never been so fragmented. Workers has never been so precarious. 
and there has never been such a wealth inequality between capital and labor. This is the situation we are in. What do we need to do? We need to close the break in our leg, turn crutches into high jump poles, so to get on and ride the horse. How, How to close the break? We need a new worker statute. We need a charter of universal labor rights. In 2019, a CGIL collected about 1.5 million signatures to submit a citizen's initiative bill on that. Rights belong to everyone. Each person must be provided with a core of rights, universal labor rights, which must does regard the legal qualification of the employment relationship, which must be unavailable to exemptions. Such a protection should not be related to the single type of work, employee, self-employed, para subordinate work, but to the person who works and to the risks to which he or she is exposed. And that's what we need in Italy and also what we need in Europe. The resolution of a Europe, on a European pillar of social rights uh, of January 2017 asked social partners and the European Commission to work together on a proposal for a directive ensuring for every worker a core set of enforceable rights regardless of the type of contract um, or, uh, including equal treatment, health and safety protection, uh, protection during maternity leave, provisions on uh, working time and rest time, work-life balance, access to training, in-work support for people with disabilities, proper information, consultation, participation rights, freedom of association, uh, collective bargaining, collective action, and also the recommendation of the Council of November 2019 asked the Member States to provide access to social protection for all workers, all self-employed. The point is that we need to overcome the dichotomy between dependent workers with rights and independent workers without rights. And that not by introducing hybrid employment status with lower protection. That's not a way forward to regulate platform work. Hybrid categories can represent obstacles to more meaningful protection and never resulted in more clarity or lower litigation. Litigation occurs. Uh, we need that workers without any objectives may enjoy their employment rights in full. It is possible, it is possible to combine employment protection and flexibility. And uh, um, uh, that, that's what we need. A new worker statute will, would bring many workers out from the grade zone. If the leg is no more broken, the crutch becomes a high jump pole. In Italy, um, the, we have a coverage of collective bargaining at industry level of about 80-85% of all employees, which is quite high. But what we need is a low to 35% the representativeness of social partners. Such a law will allow us to apply the Article 39 of the Italian Constitution. And that would avoid collective agreements signed by unrepresentative unions, uh, which generate social dumping. And that would have avoided the agreement signed by us to delivery with the minority union UGL. Platform workers should be included under the scope of existing collective agreement or in case in new, in uh, adopt uh, um, specific uh, collective bargaining agreements. National collective bargaining is the way 
to the recognition of protection to the platform workers. But it is not enough. We have to recompose the multi-sectoral supply and subcontracting chain and hold companies accountable and responsible for the relations they may have with any commercial partners. If, for example, just it makes use of local logistics providers to deliver orders, just it should make sure that the workers of the partner enjoy their rights in full. Or if a retail company or a fast food company makes use of a partner to deliver orders, it should be should make sure that deliver, delivery workers enjoy their rights in full. To this end, we have to strengthen the bargaining at company level to improve and the bargaining at industry level. But it is not enough. As platforms are often multinational companies, they should exercise a due diligence, a social rights due diligence towards subsidiaries, suppliers, franchising, other commercial partners, as provided for in the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights or on the OECD guidelines for multinational companies. They should uh, identify, prevent, mitigate, address, remediate any risks posed to human rights, including social and labor rights, both by its own operations or, or, and by those of its business relationship. And waiting for a European directive an international treaty on this matter, on due diligence, human rights due diligence, and responsible business conduct, it will be crucial to strengthen the social dialogue and industrial relations at transnational level. That means stronger information and consultation mechanism through a review of the EWC directive, the Directive of European Works, Works Council, and a legal framework for transnational company agreements. But it is not enough. And, and the poll which may allow us to reach and ride the horse is participation. Um, I don't love to use apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic tones or optimistic tones while talking about the digitalization. Both of these approach are based on the idea of passivity or subordination of social actors, policymakers, and citizens at large. We want to manage the change. Only a democratic participation, only workers' participation can make the fourth industrial revolution benefit all without leaving anyone behind. And the Article 46 of our Italian Constitution, which recognizes the right of workers to cooperate in the management of enterprises, has not applied yet. I don't refer to the participation of workers' representatives in the board of directors of companies. I refer to the, um, to the right of the workers' representatives to participate and make their voice heard in the system-making process concerning innovation of products, innovation of processes, concerning the use of technology in every aspect of the business organization. Trade unions should negotiate not only economic or regulatory provisions for workers, but also should participate in the development, implementation, monitoring and assessment of any relevant corporate strategies impacting employment. I think social partners and legislators have to face many challenges to rewrite labor law and fit for a socially sustainable for industrial revolution. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Stefania. And now I can give the floor to uh, Marco Marrone, Riders Union Bologna. Marco, 
Do you hear me? Hi. Yeah, yes, I'm here. I'm okay, talking. okay, fine. Hi. So, please, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Eduard. Thank you, all of you, for inviting me in this meeting. It's, uh, it's been very interesting afternoon, and I hope to give a, a relevant contribution to the discussion since much has already been said. So uh, it always, uh, it often happens when, when, when I speak about the experience of a writer's union in Bologna, I often have to deal with people telling me, oh, this is about... Uh, uh, this is about new unionism, new forms of unionism, how unions work in this new fashion and sparkling environment. And this is not what it is about. Uh, this is <laughs> this is what uh, what I will ask you, what I will argue in the discussion. And uh, so with the idea of somehow getting from this experience, getting to know what we might, we might learn, and not only about what's happening in the food delivery sector, but what's generally happening to the labor condition at this time, uh, uh, this period. So uh, I will start by saying a little bit about what it is Riders Union in Bologna, what is myself. In Myself, I'm not a, a, a writer. I'm, um, I'm not a food delivery worker. I'm a researcher in sociology. And me, like many other precarious researchers here, somehow have joined this struggle because uh, it also, it's also a struggle that talks uh, uh, more beyond what uh, food delivery workers. One of the main slogans, in fact, it's not for us, but for everyone. And this is to indicate that not only food delivery worker has to deal with the algorithm boss, uh, not only food delivery worker has to deal with employers and looking for strategies to go out and do not, do not respect employment sta standards, not only food delivery workers has to deal with uh, uh, an anti-union environment. This is actually something that is growing, happening more and more common. So when uh, uh, when uh, Riders Union Bo uh, Bologna was born, it was in the autumn 2017, after that there was a global wave of uh, food delivery cycle that keeps increasing. And this is uh, definitely something that is very interesting to focus because this is about a global issue, not simply uh, a, a national one or European one. This is, in my opinion, very important to focus. And we realized at the very beginning that neither traditional organizing practices, neither traditional strategy, um, strategies would work. First of all, I mean, this is a very anti-union environment, not only because uh, there are a high speed turnover among food delivery workers, but also because at the very beginning we had to protest with masks because the four, the first four workers who protested in Italy, it happened in Turin in 2016, had been fired. <laughs> so that's like, definitely that was one of the top. In the second, in the second run, we, often, we quickly realized that that, um, we quickly realized that the traditional strategies, like for example, the strike, that it's one of the main tools that the workers' movement always said, do not work in such an environment. No? And so that's why we thought that we had to do uh, something different. So we had to go back and take some mutual aid, self-help uh, practices that have been quite common in the Italian history of uh, workers' movements. I'm thinking especially what happens to agric agricultural workers in the south of Italy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, or on the other hand, we decided to not simply target uh, uh, the platform since uh, there was too much power asymmetry since workers didn't have the possibility to handle the traditional uh, representational rights to somehow move institution and take care about this. And somehow this has worked, especially at the, the local level, the city level, that this has been a crucial level for us, uh, not simply to find the necessary resources to avoid the obstacles that platform poses in front of, uh, of, uh, of the possibility for workers to organize, but on the other hand, also to uh, uh, to have a, a um, negotiation with a local level and to experiment some forms of uh, regulation that uh, uh, happens at the local level that definitely do not uh, solve the problem of food delivery workers, but in my opinion, the signature of the Bologna uh, chart of digital rights has been basically the first step that actually moved uh, and opened a debate on the regulation in this, uh, in this context. So, so this is what I'm about to say. Uh, this is to say that, in my opinion, uh, uh, the food delivery worker struggle opens up at least three ten general tendencies that goes beyond the food delivery workers.
technologies themselves. And they have to be taken the way they are if we really want to challenge the power of platform. <laughs> Firstly, I mean, uh, the organizing practices and the general condition of unorganizable workers, it's anything uh, 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 specific for food delivery workers. Actually, uh, we might say that two thirds of, of the workers in the world do not have access to legal rights. This means, uh, this means that uh, more than being the food delivery workers, the exception, it is how industrial relations work in Europe in, during the, the, the glorious 30 that have been the exception. Because this is actually the real normality in global capitalism, with workers paid on peace work wages and uh, with, uh, with a very anti-union uh, employees. So this is something that, in my opinion, we need to take into account because this is uh, something that uh, more than happening that uh, it is the European standards that have expanded to the rest of the world. Actually, it is in Europe we are facing, to, alongside the plat general platformization of economy, a blurring board of the borders between informal and formal employment. And this is something that undermines the traditional industrial relation. So my question in this case, the question I want to open is, uh, should we fix it or should we rethink them? No? So that's, I leave it as an open question. The second point is that in my opinion, uh, uh, the experiences we happen in Italy that Michele was telling us about it, but also the experiences that we heard in California, I think that makes evident the fact that we should be brave enough to admit that platforms are not company like other ones. I mean that in one hand, they do definitely accelerate some tendencies that we already experienced in network capitalism and in outsourcing processes mm -hmm. uh, and you know, in, uh, in, the, in the gig economy framework, so in the tendency about, for employers to use alternative legal arrangements. But on the other hand, we also have to look at the way in which this company works, especially, for example, the way in which they manage data. That is something that is crucial, in my opinion. We can't, we can't challenge the power of platform in this regard by simply expanding the uh, rights of subordinate works. Because, because this is something totally different. I've heard that in many cases we talk, we talk about bargaining with the algorithm. But in my opinion, this risks to be a, as, a, as an empty slogan if we do not really see that we have to challenge the real co social condition and political condition that has allowed uh, platforms to operate. And this means that what has happened in Italy with the UGL signing their, their pilot contract, it's not a case, okay? It's something that uh, it has happened before. It, there are hundreds of, 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 of contracts that are over there only to remove the rights from work. And in my opinion, the, the point is that we can't wait anymore for a law on the representative, uh, representative of workers and a law for a minimum wage that are able to think beyond the traditional notion of, of, of work. So this is not simply about work organized in space and time, but these rights should be guaranteed to all workers working for someone else's benefit, indifferently and independently about the way in which the work is organized. This means modernized labor rights. This means uh, to adequate welfare employment protection to the challenges that the new economy is posing. And it's not about removing uh, rights to work. Last point, if we really want to challenge the power of platform, it's, uh, again, mm -hmm. I think we should really follow what uh, food workers are telling us. When they say, not for us, but for everyone. What they mean is it's that uh, the condition of exploitation are structural for these workers and anything that starts when they log into the platforms. <laughs> those conditions start before are the results of a, uh, of a cut in welfare state, of a lack of a redistribution of resources. So in my opinion, we need to challenge this real condition that are not the result of some fancy technological innovation, but are the results of the, uh, of the way in which uh, somehow, uh, uh, um, uh, the way in which uh, platforms are benefiting of the condition that neoliberalism has produced in this part of the world in the last 30 years. So in my opinion, another leg definitely should be that of basic income. Because if we do not 
and, and I'm talking about a proper basic income, not the, the kind of active policies that we have in Italy that it's not really, uh, it's not really uh, clear what, what's their aim, what they're talking about. We need to establish, especially in these moments, especially in these times like the crisis that we are facing, that that has been the real bread for platform to expand. So in this case, in my opinion, if we do not want to, uh, uh, this kind of uh, unregulated platformization to go with, uh, in this way, in my opinion, we need to establish, to raise the floor, to establish a level for everyone that do not force individuals to sell their working abilities for one, two hours per, per hour. If we don't do this, then definitely the point will be that not only the condition of riders will not be solved, but soon all other workers will have to face a similar condition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, we run a bit out of time, but in any case, I would like to dare to abuse of the patient of our <laughs> participants and give the floor again to all our speakers for a very short statement, conclusive statement of two minutes, if you, if you agree, because otherwise I think it will be uh, really too long. Susan. Yes, I will speak just uh, very, very quickly. Um, I, I I think that there is a lot of overlap in the way scholars uh, and trade unionists uh, and others are looking at this problem. Um, we will fail in our efforts to achieve social justice if we are slaves to different categories. Uh, I love the idea of just saying, forget the gray zone. What outcomes do we need? What protections do we need for human beings? Uh, rather than playing a game of categories, uh, which will only encourage the platform companies to play the game better than everyone else. Uh, so I think we're on the right path, despite the big setback we have had in California. I believe that forums like this one are essential, bringing people together from other countries to share ideas uh, so that ultimately we get the outcomes uh, that platform workers deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan and Ludovic. Yeah, thank you. I would just like, yeah, you can hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, no, just to say that I think uh, there's a narrative um, that is often used uh, by um, by platforms and by different actors that uh, there's a, we are in a crisis, it's difficult to maintain the, uh, the employment relationship, so there's a need for flexibility, do not uh, uh, hinder us uh, from uh, doing what we, we, uh, we, we do because we are providing to people that are vulnerable uh, source of incomes. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, we we also hear that uh, we have to find the balance uh, between market opportunities and that these uh, platforms have to uh, continue uh, having the possibility to develop uh, and the balance of uh, the respect of uh, of human and uh, labor rights. Uh, for us, it's uh, here. It's uh, also a discussion on the on the future, a plat the platformization of the economy uh, in itself. So, of course, there's a possibility, uh, it is possible to g digitalize the economy and platformize the economy uh, with a human in control com uh, uh, policy. This is not the case with how it is going on uh, for the moment. And we cannot, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, uh, we cannot find the balance between how it works now uh, and uh, uh, we cannot bargain on human, uh, uh, on human rights so there are basic uh, uh, rights like uh, the wage uh, the working conditions uh, predictability uh, of working conditions access to collective bargaining uh, health and safety at work etc that cannot uh, be bargained there are principles that have to be uh, enforced uh, and uh, yeah this is exactly the debate uh, in uh, in which we are uh, with a segment of the economy that is not so widespread for the moment, but that can really, with the massive investment that we will have in digitalization in the uh, in the coming decade, 
it can really uh, go all over the uh, the economy in different uh, sectors uh, of the economy so it's a uh, it's really a discussion about the future of work also that we have uh, here and this is why we have to preserve uh, the most uh, the more possible the employment relationship thank you thank you very much ludovic stefania Yes, Eduardo. Uh, I'd like to use these two minutes to briefly comment the um, agreement between ASO Delivery and UGL. Um, ASO Delivery, the Employers Association, has never wanted to recognize the logistics agreement, the collective agreement for riders and the recent protocol. And okay, but it uh, uh, also delivery cannot choose their counterpart. Um, uh, uh, also delivery has to negotiate with a more uh, comparative, uh, um, more represent comparatively representative uh, trade unions at national level. Uh, not uh, and that's important because uh, we need to reach an agreement improve and complement the legal provisions not to change the legal provisions um, after the signing with uh, um, with us delivery the european uh, economic and social committee expelled the, the ugl representative from the workers group because that agreement uh, uh, maintained uh, workers as self-employed uh, maintained in practice in practice uh, pay for peace work and other 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 stuff uh, we need a, um, an agreement which may uh, pro uh, which may provide riders with uh, uh, traditional rights and new rights specific rights according to these new forms of work but uh, which can improve and complement the legal provisions and in and the, the, the government should play its, its role uh, for this reason this is the reasons why we have asked the, the government to launch an extraordinary campaign of inspections aimed at checking the lawfulness and legitimacy, legitimacy of labor relations uh, in this sector Thank you, thank you very much, Stefania. And now, uh, Marco, you have the floor for a final statement. Yes, um, I would like to sound a little more optimistic on my final statement, as actually uh, we have done uh, some interesting um, step ahead, uh, let, let's put it in this way, in the sense that at a local level uh, now we have signed uh, with the Bologna Spill of Rights an agreement with a local uh, platform that is called the Miami News Niam, and soon uh, they will hire their workers as subordinated workers, applying the contract, that, uh, national contract of the logistical services. So this is a, a re totally reply to the demand that we always have done, and this has been possible through a work that we have done at the local level. So this is a really, really crucial in my opinion, because maybe it's not as evident as hell the rest that it's happening, but then it works, it pays off. And, and this is definitely a winning uh, of, of, of the riders union and of all the of the workers that for three years have strikeed about. The fact that the same decision has been made, but uh, uh, by, by just it, um, company that also wants to hire and subordinate workers the fact that uh, there are uh, um, co new companies like lavoro più that are also hiring the subordinate workers these are all winnings that the food delivery workers have had so in my opinion this says that uh, the struggle pays off so we have had some uh, some step ahead in this sense and definitely now the point the challenge for the government is how do we make these uh, best practice good example the norm the system what is for everyone because it can't be that uh, uh, rights for workers are guaranteed only in the places where they are able to organize so now this is a, a something that we ha all have to do for uh, um, all uh, self-organized unions uh, the, 
general unions, traditional unions and the government, but now this has to be the task because uh, the fake contract of UG the UGL ASO delivery signed, in my, in my opinion, is shaking one day after the other. Not even companies want anymore that contract, like just it has left out from, from ASO delivery. We are talking about the biggest uh, player in Italy. So now we are already ahead of our food delivery workers. My opinion is how do we generalize the practices that uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, how do we generalize the practices that we have discovered somehow, that we have experimented through this frame of workers that have no, uh, no, no rights? And on the other hand, how do we gener generalize, uh, universalize the rights that uh, uh, Riders Union Bologna has been able to gain in Bologna, but can be only, only in this city? So, uh, I would like to warmly thank all the, the speakers because you really succeeded in giving us really interesting uh, issues uh, of reflection and also possible solutions in a very short time and in a very limited time. So, I really congratulate with you. Uh, of course, I, I would would have very a lot of comments and a lot of remarks but i know that the time is 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 running out so uh, i would like only just to underline the fact that you all uh, you have adopted a very uh, holistic and comprehensive approach to this subject matter so it's not just a problem of the riders or a problem of the kind of platform workers it's a challenge it's a challenge that, of course, the trade union movements, uh, scholars, but I think also the employers have to face. As uh, they have to face, uh, I would like to take the, the the last words of Marco as a, of course, a, a, as a as a sign of uh, goodwill. Uh, it's really unfortunate that we had no uh, employers representative in this. Uh, round table, uh, Jacopo uh, tried hard to, to have them, but uh, that's the, the results. And I, I do really hope that in the future we could come back and had also some dialogue uh, with employers' organization, because I'm really convinced that uh, the employer is not the algorithm. This is a very uh, fancy and a fashionable solution but it's not the truth we as label lawyers first of all uh, we we need an employer the, the algorithm is just a, a, a sort of screen uh, so you 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 are not really dealing with the algorithm of course the algorithm is dangerous may be dangerous but at the end of the day we have to look for the the real employer and uh, have a talk with this employer so thank you very much and uh, I really uh, uh, thank you, and I hope uh, I see still 59 people connected. So th this means that our, our audience is still here. And so thank you very much. Thank you to the organizer, and see you soon, maybe on some platform, some somehow. <laughs> thank you all. Bye. Bye. See you soon.